Hey, took me a while to wrap my head around the way we're going to proceed with the environments. I can't say I came up with an exceptionally elegant solution, but we'll manage. Today we'll talk about Ashina outskirts and what interesting bits we can find there, along with some of the remaining items. We'll also explore a tiny bit of character arts, and we'll go through all the sculptor's idols' names and see how they were localized. As usual, we'll quickly go over the disclaimers, legend, and sources. If it's not the first time around, feel free to skip ahead. Number one, use common sense. Please do not assume that I have access to some secret true knowledge. I'm just entertained by reading Sekiro in Japanese. My lore theories are just theories, so treat them accordingly. Number two, I am not a professional translator. I have never worked on localization. Yes, I will say that something is translated poorly and something is not, and it will be my personal point of view. Ultimately, my goal is to give you the information so you can see if the localization was good or not, whether something important was lost or not. My opinion is just that, and I choose to share it. Number three, I am not an expert on Buddhism or Shintoism. I will leave links to the religious terms that we will encounter so you can read more on your own if you're interested. As usual, the transcriptions I give do not follow all academic rules and I don't think it's necessary. They're just here to represent the pronunciation in case you're curious. All sources I used for this research will be listed in the description box below along with all the additional information that I referenced throughout the video so you can read more if you're interested. There you will also find a link to my original blog post if you want to read it through. A mysterious woman drops a letter into the well. What does it say? Well, first of all, let's see what it's called. Ornamental letter is Hanashobu no Fumi, a letter with a Japanese iris. This name makes me exceptionally happy because I always thought that Ashina clan sigil was a Japanese iris, but the game never says it explicitly. Turns out that it does right at the start of the game. Letter thrown into a well by someone. The English localization skipped Emma's role in delivering the letter. The next part is indented to convey the contents. Unfortunately, the English localization fails to capture some of the nuances of the text solely because of how different English and Japanese are. The original starts with to Master Kuro's Master Wolf. It uses the respectful suffix dono after both names, Kuro and Wolf. You can instantly see that this letter was written by a man because for you, the author uses the pronoun kiden, a respectful pronoun used by men in letters to their equals or superiors. From just this word, you can derive that this letter was written by a man, and this man has respect for Wolf. The rest of the translation is not as accurate as it could be. The localization repeats the Moonview Tower twice and adds stay silent, stay vigilant part that gives this letter an overall patronizing tone that does not reflect the original. The localized version doesn't say where the tower is, despite the fact that the original text gives directions. Your fate is now at the Moonview Tower. Escape the well and you will face it. There is only one path, and as you move across the gap, the tower will be right in front of you. Even though you don't have a blade, you will be able to find your way if you go stealthily. I know I said that we'll go around Ashina outskirts first and the reservoir is a part of Ashina castle. Well, the well is here and we need to reach the tower, so there is nothing I can do. Ashina Reservoir area is called Ashinajo Suishukuroa. First of all, all areas pertaining to Ashina Castle have the same naming pattern in Japanese, Ashina Castle plus the name of the area. In English, it's just the name of the area because they were most likely limited in symbols. Suishukuroa can be translated as sailor's quarters, but kuroa is more of an architectural term that refers to the walls of a Japanese castle and areas surrounded by those walls. It is a defensive territory that accommodates soldiers and additional castle facilities. Let's follow the art book picture by picture. The place where Wolf wakes up after Emma drops the letter is Idozoko, bottom of the well. The secret passage to the right of the well, where you will eventually lead Kuro, is marked as Nukiana, secret or underground passage. As you climb out of the well, you can see Ashina Castle towering over you on the other side of the reservoir, this view is called Tenshu Gaikan, exterior appearance of the Tenshu. Tenshu is a central tower or a main keep of a Japanese castle. It was first defined during the late Sengoku period, actually. Of course, castles that were built previously also had some sort of defensible main part, but Sengoku period is considered to be the time when Tenshu gained architectural definition. 
Since the art book contains early concept art, on the picture you can see that there was supposed to be some sort of structure near the well, but it didn't make it into the game. There is a little bit of inconsistency between the game and the art book, although nothing too extreme. In the game, the Moonview Tower is called Tsukimi Yagura, where Tsukimi is moon viewing and Yagura means watchtower. In the art book, it is called Tsukimi Ro, where Ro also means watchtower or lookout. So I think only the reading is different, both kanji mean the same thing. Anyway, it's quite a beautiful name for a defensive structure. Then we can see the interior of the Moonview Tower with Kuro quietly reading a book inside. This is probably one of my most favorite spreads in the whole art book. While we are here, let's talk about Kuro. Unfortunately, I am completely useless when it comes to Japanese period clothes, so I feel like I'm skipping half the context just because I don't have enough knowledge on this subject. However, there are things even I can understand and describe, so that will have to do. Kuro wears a type of hakama, trousers. He also wears a vest with detachable large sleeves, and on both his sleeves you can see a five-petal golden flower, or maybe a leaf? that has been present since early concept art. Over top, he wears what I figured to be a dofku garment, by far the most interesting piece of his clothes, and not because it looks beautiful and has faint flower motifs, but because on the back it has a bold black dragonair sigil that gets me incredibly excited whenever I see it. Kuro's clothes are fascinating to look at, there is a lot going on. If you choose the ending where he becomes human and leaves Ashina Lens, You'll see him in his travel attire, and the art book also has a picture of it. He looks almost the same minus the dofku, but it's hard not to notice that he now has no identification. The dofku with the dragonair mark is gone, he still has long white sleeves, but they're both empty. He wears an inro case, a case for holding small objects, on his neck, prepared for travel. Moonview Tower has a couple of partitioning screens called tsuitate that depict cranes, mandarin ducks, and phoenixes all period appropriate. For some reason I always assumed they took those from the Hirata estate and brought here so Kura had familiar objects around, like his books. I have no proof of that, obviously, so don't take my word for it. Then you exit the tower and go through what is essentially a tutorial culminating with a miniboss, group leader Shikinori Yamauchi. He's not a samurai general, just a leader of a group of soldiers guarding the perimeter of Ashina Reservoir. I wonder if he's related to Tenzen Yamauchi. We'll meet him later. As Wolf and Kuro escape through Nukiana, secret passage, they find themselves on a Suzukino, a field of silver grass. Suzuki denotes Chinese silver grass, a type of perennial tall grass native to China, Japan, Taiwan, and Korea. But of course, Genichiro is waiting for them, and even if Wolf manages to defeat him, a Niger shinobi attacks him with a heavy shuriken, which gives Genichiro the opportunity to sever Wolf's arm and take Kuro away. We'll talk more about Genichiro when we meet him again in Ashina Castle. I love the silver grass battles because there is so much wordless stuff going on. As Wolf draws the katana, you can see that his movements are imprecise. It is not a smooth draw that he would expect. Years at the bottom of the well took a toll on him, and he is not as agile or as strong as he used to be. That is why he loses. However, at the end of the game, as you stand against Genichiro one more time on this field, that katana draw is smoother than breath, and even Kuro's body falling into the grass behind him cannot break Wolf's concentration. Love it. And that's how we get to Ashina outskirts proper. In Japanese, it's called Ashina Jo Joka, Ashina Castle, Castle Town. The word Joka refers to the land near a castle or a castle town that developed around the castle of a feudal lord. Wolf wakes up in Aredera dilapidated temple or temple ruins. There he meets Bushi, a sculptor specializing in Buddha statues. Of course we know that it is orangutan, former shinobi turned Shura, whose arm was severed by Kensei Ishin's Ashina cross many years ago. He carves Buddhas not to be consumed by the flames of hatred, but all the Buddhas that he carves are demonic Buddhas, kibutsu. The temple is filled with them. If you look closely at the sculptor, you'll see that he wears an enro case around his neck. I wonder what he keeps there. The outside of the temple is plastered with Ofuda talismans. Ofuda can be made of various materials, even though they're often depicted in their paper form, they can also be made of wood, metal, or even cloth. They can be found in both Shinto shrines and Buddhist temples, imbued with the power of kami, or a Buddha or a Bodhisattva, respectively. 
Some of Huda amulets have a specific purpose and can be kept at home. Omamori amulets that we have already discussed can be considered a type of Afuda. In Aredera, though, the number of Afuda and their chaotic placement feels kind of unsettling. Maybe it was the sculptor who placed them in such numbers on the outside of the temple to help him battle the flames of hatred. On closer inspection, you can see that some talismans have burnt edges. In the temple, you can also see a zushi, a small shrine with double doors used to store important Buddhist items such as sutras. Aredera's zushi is open and empty and there are red markings as if of dried blood or something like that. I wonder what was kept inside. No severed arms, I hope. There is also a secret shinobi path to be found in the bamboo thicket. In their book it is called Shinobi Nukemichi, Shinobi's Secret Path or Shinobi's Shortcut. Unfortunately, the art book doesn't have a more detailed depiction of the markings on the floor before the shinobi door, so I can't read what the kanji say, if they are meant to be discernible at all. Aradera gives shelter to all kinds of weird folks, and to the left of the temple you can find Shinazu Hanbei, Hanbei the Undying. The place itself is called Shinazu no Shuren, the Undying's Training. There is one more person that can be found in the dilapidated temple, and of course it is Ksushi Emma, Dr. Emma. In Japanese, she has only one M in her name. I suppose the localization chose to write it as Emma so that Western players would find it more familiar. From the art book, it is clear that more people apart from Wolf were supposed to have the immortality, or at least the white mark, because Emma has it on some concept arts. There is an early concept art of her with her eyes covered with bandages, hair extremely long and half white, held by a period-appropriate pink paper hair tie. She's standing to someone lying on the ground, and you can see that her right arm is also bandaged. Interestingly enough, there is an art with Emma as she is in the game, meaning an art done later into the development, but still with a white oath-bound mark on the left side of her face. Emma's garments are exceptionally beautiful. She wears a white underrobe, then a robe in a purple shade that has a crane embroidery on it, and what I figured to be a mobakama, a pleated wrapped skirt tied with a blue string. It is ankle length for easy travel. Emma is not really a court lady standing around all day. She is a busy woman of a noble trade. There is a small detail that makes me wonder. In the early concept art, she has something like a thread or a thin string tied around both her wrists in a bow tie. In later arts, she has the same string tied around her right wrist. I am not sure what it is or what significance it holds. She doesn't have it in the game though, so it's just my curiosity. As we leave the dilapidated temple, we come across a broken bridge and a narrow pathway to the left, which is called Gakimichi, path along the cliff. Apparently, somewhere around here, there was supposed to be a Goshinboku, a sacred tree, but either it didn't make it into the game or I can't see it. The first demonic Buddha that we touch is called just Ashina Outskirts, in Japanese Ashina Jo Joka, Ashina Castle, Castle Town, as we already discussed. The enemies in the outskirts aren't anything exceptional, just some dogs and Ashina Zohyo, Ashina common soldiers. The next idol is called Outskirts Wall Gate Path. In Japanese it is Castle Town Outer Wall Path to the Castle Gate, which is way too long. Here we can enter our first of many Yaguramon, a tower above the gates. You'll see this type of construction countless times throughout the game. Usually it's a gate nestled between cliffs and then a tower-like construction above it. Here we find our first prosthetic tool, the small but mighty shuriken wheel. The next place where we encounter our first official minibus is called Jōka no Noroshijō, Castle Town Smoke Signal Lookout. Smoke signals are one of the oldest means of long-distance communication, and apparently this is the very place that was supposed to send a smoke signal if there was an invasion to warn the inner castle. This is why our friend Naomori Kawarada is stationed here, guarding the smoke signal base, responsible for warning everyone if something goes wrong. There is also a whole bunch of wood here for this very purpose, I assume. It's kind of ironic that this place is later burned to the ground by the demon of hatred. A warning of sorts, as intended. His original name is Samurai Taisho Kawarada Naomori, Samurai General Naomori Kawarada. It's worth noting that reading Japanese names and surnames is quite challenging, so for example these kanji can be read as Kawada, Kawarada, and even Kawarahada, so I won't really nitpick, except in two cases. In the outskirts there are plenty of Hirata banners, and you can even see the colored variety of the sigil with golden buds. It is also here that for the first time we see the famed banners with giant kanji on them. 
They're present here, also on the battlefield where you fight Kyobu and in some other places. Many people wondered what's written on them, and I am here with my bit of research. Turns out, this is a quote from the Wuzi, a classic Chinese work of military strategies and one of China's seven military classics. I can't really give you a short word-for-word translation, but I can attempt to convey the general idea behind this quote. If you die, you'll die with honor, so fight without fear. However, don't throw away your life, since there is no shame in survival. Something along those lines. Kind of encouraging if you think about it. There is so much talk about dying with honor that people need to be reminded that surviving the battle is not dishonorable. After successfully defeating General Kabarada, we get our very first prayer bead. Its original name is Juzudama, and it is a plant. There is a tall tropical plant called tear grass or adlai, and one of its varieties bears fruits with a pearly white shell that is so hard that they were used as beads to make rosaries and necklaces. Juzudama can denote both the plant itself and the rosary bead. A bead from a torn prayer necklace. Interesting that the English localization just says will increase maximum vitality and posture, which is very true. But the Japanese version says the power of your body will grow, and as such, you'll increase your max posture and HP. Moving on from General Kavarada, we have the first encounter with a giant representative of the Tarohei, the raw troop. They can wield a mallet or a giant bell, both versions are called the same. Further down the path, there is an old lady ringing a little Omamori bell. In the art book, she is called Nogami no Baba, Old Nogami Woman, Nogami being the surname. Not far from her, there is a wounded man, her son, Nogami Inosuke. He is a Hirata clan samurai, as we can clearly see because of the Hirata clan sigil all over his garments. The stairway idol is called Castle Town Outer Wall, Stairway to Tiger's Den. Koko is an idiomatic expression that denotes a very dangerous place, Jaws of Death, Tiger's Den. We'll see what it's referring to in a moment. A little before being smashed or thrown off a cliff by the ogre, we make a pleasant acquaintance with Monouri no Anayama, Anayama the Peddler. Then we encounter our first chained ogre. In the original, they're all called Akaoni, Red Demon. Kinda hard not to notice that not only are they much bigger than regular humans, but they also have blonde hair. There is an item that can tell us more about the red-eyed ogres, and it's the second prayer necklace. All necklaces have the same naming pattern, it's just number plus necklace. This one is Nino Nenju, second prayer necklace. They also share the first two paragraphs that we'll discuss here just once. A prayer necklace from tied-up loose prayer beads offered to a demonic Buddha. The next line repeats the one from a prayer beads description. If you manage to get your hands on such a necklace, the power of your body will grow, increasing your max HP and posture. I love the a prayer bead necklace befits the strong localization, but it reflects the last part of the paragraph. The first part translates to It's only appropriate to carry prayer beads that comprise a Nenju prayer necklace. So, a prayer necklace is a religious term, in this particular case an item of Buddhism. In Japanese there are two words for prayer necklaces, Nenju and Juzu. What's the difference? Prayer necklaces are used as counters for prayer repetitions. As one repeats a prayer, they advance the necklace by one bead. This is done so the person can focus on the words and on the process rather than trying to keep track of how many times they repeated a prayer or a chant. This kind of prayer necklace is referred to as juzu. However, a prayer necklace can also be used for a silent prayer to Buddha, and in this case it will be called nenju. In Sekiro, all prayer necklaces are nenju necklaces. Let's see what this necklace says about ogres. From the original it is not clear whether it tells a story of one ogre or multiple ogres. The localization assumes it's one, but we meet several of them during the game, and we even meet a Mibu ogre turned noble who is not aggressive, the carp attendant. However, this necklace probably tells the story of this particular ogre. There are giant men in Ashina called Red Ogres. Why did he become a Red Eyes and ran amok? They say he was held in the abandoned dungeon for a long time. As you can see, the localization has it all backwards. The ogre had gone red-eyed and then was shut away, but he's right there on the stairway. This necklace actually tells us that this ogre was long imprisoned in the abandoned dungeon. Something happened to him there, apparently, and he turned red-eyed and wreaked havoc. This little lore bit is meant to be one of the first clues to what goes down in the dungeon and what experiments Dojun conducts there. 
Moving on through yet another Yaguramon, A Tower Above the Gates, we finally reach a place that the art book refers to as Koko, Tiger's Den, or a dangerous place. The place is pretty dangerous, considering how many people there are, and the presence of Samurai Taisho Yamauchi Tenzen, Samurai General Tenzen Yamauchi. There is also a guy who raises alarm by banging on something that looks like a pot lid as soon as he sees you. These guys are called Mihariban in the art book, which means a lookout or a guard. Let's see what the first prayer necklace has to say about the samurai generals. Its original name is Ichi no Nenju, first prayer necklace. The first two paragraphs are identical to those of the other necklaces, so we'll discuss the last unique one. It is not really about Ashina army and its ferocity. The original says the adults of the Ashina people, which sounds kind of confusing and weird in English, but I suppose it implies that the Ashina clan is so powerful that every adult is a capable warrior. Above all, those people who become samurai generals possess an exceptional talent for swordsmanship. They all excel at the Ashina fighting style, established by Shin. As we head towards the cliff, it's worth mentioning that this little construction here is actually a Mido, enshrinement hall of a Buddha or a temple, albeit rather small. Probably people of Ashina put this little temple here to protect them against the headless dwelling in the caves below. Temple posting. Turn back if you value your life. You can't behead the headless. Our swords and pikes did nothing. There is actually a little wordplay with the word kubi, neck, but also head. If you value your life in Japanese is if you value your head. Our swords and pikes did nothing is not entirely accurate. Neither a sword nor a spear can get through or connect. This is meant to hint at using divine confetti because otherwise your attacks do not properly connect to apparition type enemies. Talking about the headless takes me back to the very first video I made about Sekiro. In Japanese, they're called kubinashi, literally headless, and they all wear just a funtoshi loincloth. They're also gigantic and wield odachi swords that seem a perfect fit for their size. Remember how we discussed a Gokan headless and burial mounds full of heads that people built on the cliff to appease him? Turns out, in the cave of the Akko headless, there is also such a mound. They're called kubizuka. It's just so dark in this cave and I get so panicky whenever I set foot in there that I didn't notice it for three playthroughs. This localization is pretty accurate. Kyoka no Tani is indeed on the bridge valley. This is where we encounter our first god of the land, Nushi no Shirohebi, god of the land white snake. There we can also find an old withered palanquin that the art book calls Shirohebi no Koshi, white snake's palanquin. The word koshi can also mean portable shrine. As we emerge on the other side of the cave, having escaped marriage to the White Serpent, there is a new idol. Its original name is Otemon no Demaru, Front Castle Gate Tower. Demaru actually denotes either a tower or a smaller castle that is a part of a larger castle. The next place that you reach is called Senjoato, Battlefield Ruins or Battlefield Remains. Of course, here we encounter Gyobu Masataka Oniwa, a former bandit leader who was once defeated by Shin. Ishin just couldn't resist the charm of Gyobu, who can, and took him in with all of his thugs, granting him the spear of General Tamura and also making him responsible for the upbringing and education of little Genichiro. All the wooden towers on the battlefield are called Seiro Yagura, a battlefield watchtower. Unfortunately, the art book does not depict the insides of the Damaru Tower that we've passed on the way here, where we meet Tengu for the first time. Before we look at the rat description that he gives us, we should not forget about probably my favorite NPC in the entire game, an old lady around the corner with a lit candle, just standing there, minding her own business near what's got to be the most useless shortcut in the history of shortcuts. Believe it or not, but this lady is in the art book, and she's called Shuragatari, Shura Narrator. She's basically the killjoy of the game. Whenever you approach her, she tells you that whatever you do is useless, the war will continue, the flames of hatred will be spreading and piling up somewhere. She also implies that Wolf is stupid not to ponder where all these flames of hatred go. She is charming. Try talking to her at several points throughout the game, and most certainly after defeating the Demon of Hatred. The lady knows how to uplift your spirits. Sosogaki, Red or Mouse Description I find it particularly charming that Tengu wrote a bullet list, and you can actually see that it was reflected in the item picture. Remember that in Japanese you write from right to left, top to bottom, so the little dots at the top of the page are actually a bullet list. 
Did you know that this quest is actually different in Japanese? The original tells you to go and kill one single rat to complete the quest. The English version says rats, making you think that you have to kill all of the small guys when in fact you only need one. This one. He wears a different type of hat. While we are talking about assassin hats, Tengu says that that one rat wears a kasa hat. But kasa is a very wide notion. There are dozens of types of kasa hats made out of bamboo or rice straw. The rat we're looking for wears what appears to be a takohatsugasa, a big bowl-shaped hat that covers the face. All shinobi at the Senpo temple wear these. These kasa hats were actually worn by Buddhist monks to allow anonymity so they could travel undisturbed. In the art book, the Senpo temple shinobi is depicted with this bowl-shaped hat and called rappa, which translates to spy, or hooligan. The English localization calls them assassins, which is a touch pretentious for my taste and does not reflect their fall from grace as they degraded from the Senpo Temple shinobi protecting holy grounds to common thugs kidnapping children. Other rats wear cone-shaped hats, and I'm not sure if this is a hierarchy thing or something else. Black Badger, the leader of Senpo Temple shinobi, wears a cone hat. In the rat description, it is said that there are more rats lurking about, so it might be referring to the cone-shaped ones. Confusing. The Japanese also uses a counter for small animals when talking about rats. The next idol is Ashina Castle Gate, and its original name is Otemon, from Castle Gate. As you proceed behind the gates, there are more Yagoramon, a tower above the gates, a three-story tower, or it might be a weapon storehouse. There is also a piece of structure called Ishiotoshi, literally throwing rocks. It is a small balcony, usually built above gates or around corners to enable defenders to throw things at the attackers. This place is called the Flaming Bull Square before the gates to the inner castle. What a mouthful. Blazing Bull's original name is Hyushi, literally fireball. This way of treating bulls is unfortunately a part of history. In ancient China, sword blades were tied to bulls' horns, edge side up, then a pile of reed was strapped to their tails and ignited so they would charge into enemy armies. The tower you see on the Blazing Bull Square is yet another type of watchtower, and it's called Monomiyagura. And just like that, we have reached the Ashina Castle. But before we wrap up, I think Third Prayer Necklace has some information on the Blazing Bull. Sanno Nenju, Third Prayer Necklace. I would really appreciate if the English localization wrote the blazing bull was, instead of writing just bull and then adding fiery. The original uses the name of the boss, Hyushi, blazing bull. The last line is a little different in Japanese. Something has to be done, or we won't last. Apparently, the blazing bull was the last resort for Ashina, as they lost more and more people in the war. I wonder why they ignited the bull when we meet him. Why would you activate such a chaotic weapon basically in your backyard when nobody's attacking you at the moment? Oh well, I guess someone dropped a match. Well, not so bad. This part of the project demands even more attention, knowledge and research than the previous one. I'd love to post more often, I really would, and I promise you I'm doing my absolute best. Can't wait to explore Ashina Castle in more detail. If I missed something or walked past things you wanted to know more about, let me know in the comments. I'm generally following the art book page by page, so I might skip something that isn't there. I hope you like the new format. Don't forget to check the description for relevant links and more reading. Thank you very much for your time, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.